Galatians, Galatians chapter 3, this is, uh, man, I don't know about you guys, but um, occasionally in my life when I feel like I have learned something and the teacher continues to talk about that something, I, I, I get a little irritated, like I get it, let's move on to the next topic. And I kind of feel like the Galatian church, the churches in Galatia, may have felt that way with Paul in this section of Scripture. And yet, when I read it, knowing that it tends to be kind of redundant, kind of long-winded about the reality that we are saved by faith only, not by works, I need to hear it again. I need to hear it again and again and again because we all have a tendency to run back to the things that we can touch and feel. The, the things that we can check off the checklist and say, I have done these things. I have proven myself. Amen? You have those tendencies in your own life. We see those tendencies throughout Old Testament history. The, the Israelites are rescued from Egypt. They're taken out of Egypt with great display of God's power and His sovereignty over all elements and situations. And they get into the desert and the first thing they start to do? Complain. They're complaining about freedom. They're complaining about the unknown. And they, they actually tell Moses, like, we should just go back. Because there's security in the knowledge that slavery brings. And we keep running back to it. And the churches in Galatia were struggling because the Jewish uh, man, leaders of the time we're trying to add the law back into the picture. You've been saved by grace through faith and faith alone, and yet you can't actually be counted as one of God's people unless you also adopt the law. And that's a dangerous, dangerous thing. As we'll talk about today. It's dangerous as we have talked about because it's not just limited to this thing that we call the law. In our great stupidity, <laughs> as humans, we add lots of things. Uh, I haven't got a, a large level of experience with uh, legalistic Christian traditions. But there are many. And for the first time, I, I was made aware this week that uh, there, there are legalistic Christian traditions that will uh, chastise People for wearing rubber soled shoes. Like, what's the alternative? Like, I, I'm unaware of even an option there. Like, no shoes or rubber soled shoes. All right? We add tons and tons of things. And we're really good at it. We do it because if I'm good at it and you're not, then I'm better than you. So let's make that the standard. And the crazy thing is, and the Word tells us, our hearts are deceitfully wicked. We do this on autopilot. We add things. We want to place ourselves on a pedestal above other people. We want to prove ourselves. We want to run back to slavery. Even our hearts will condemn us when the Spirit doesn't. <laughs> Which is our heart's way of saying, you're not good enough. You need to prove yourself. And the Spirit says, you're free. You're free. This is the topic that Paul is arguing, belaboring, 
striving for people to understand in churches, in places where he's been and he's ministered and he's brought the gospel. The gospel of grace. And then Judaizers, people follow him and try and change the gospel. And throughout history, we've seen the same thing. People that sound smart, eloquent, well studied, explain to us why we need to change the way we live because the way we live determines whether or not we belong to God. We're going to pick up Galatians chapter 3, verse 15. As you turn there, I just want to, I want to highlight this. TJ talked about it a little bit last week. It's, it's incredibly important. But we're working in the midst of two different arrangements that God has made. The first arrangement, the covenant that He made with Abraham, is it's a unilateral covenant. Unilateral is a big word. It just simply means that it's an agreement that only involves one party doing anything. And this unilateral covenant that God made with Abraham, He just said, you will be the father of many nations. Right? Your offspring will be as numerous as the stars in the heavens and as numerous as the sand on the seashore. Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham, in his old age, having yet never had any kids, because he's married to a barren woman, believed God. God had not yet done anything. He believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. Did Abraham do anything? Nothing. Nothing. He hadn't even gone and tried to fulfill the covenant yet. He just believed God. He understood. (laughs) Thanks. Doug got that. Well done. Then there's this bilateral covenant made. Bilateral, meaning there are two parties invested. That covenant came in the form of the law 430 years later. And that covenant is bilateral, meaning there's an agreement that if you do this, I will do this. And in that agreement... Some four to six hundred laws that had to be followed. How many people were able to follow that? Yeah, none at the time. One in all of human history, his name's Jesus. And it is this bilateral agreement, right? If you do this, I'll do this. Nobody did it. Nobody could do it. So righteousness couldn't come by the law because we didn't fulfill our end. So God granted no one righteousness by the law. And that's where Paul picks up here, where we're picking up in verse 15. In the ESV, says, to give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. That's a, a complicated sentence. But basically what it means is, if I make a promise, and there's witnesses, and that promise is ratified, you don't have the right to change it. All right. No one annuls it or adds to it once it's been ratified. Verse 16, Now the promises, there's a 
interesting here if you if you pay attention the word covenant and the word promises interchangeable here the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring it does not say and to offsprings referring to many but referring to one and to your offspring who is Christ this is what I mean <clears throat> the law which came 430 30 years afterward does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. God made the promise to Abraham. And the promise was that Christ would come. And through Christ, the door would be opened to all people to receive righteousness by God grace through faith. And the fact that the law came doesn't annul the previous promise. The fact that it came doesn't mean God's first promise was void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Guys, that, that section is one of these concepts that is like all encompassing. We have to understand that. You have to grasp that. The promise to Abraham still in effect. Not annulled by the law. Verse 19, that why then the law? Right? What's the point then? Why did God give us the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now this is interesting. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions. So what we have here, you need to kind of take a step back and, and picture this from God's perspective. He creates humanity because He loves. He creates everything that we have because He loves us and He wants us to experience life with Him. The grandeur of everything that He's given us. And then Adam and Eve can't handle it. They fail. They introduce sin and death into the picture. And for many, many years, centuries, millennia, people die. They die because of sin. And He makes a way. A promise to Abraham. And Abraham's seed. To set us all free. And that promise is not made void by the law, but God's looking down at everybody like, alright, they're, they're going to be set free when Jesus comes. But they are messed up. They're hurting each other. They're destroying everything. They're representing me very poorly. <laughs> Made in His own image. We were transgressors. All of us. Until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made, and this is interesting. It was put in place through angels by an intermediary. An inter intermediary. What does that imply? It means that there's a separation between us and God and there has to be an intermediate person or entity to bring God's knowledge and presence and guidance to us. It, it is a separation. 
an intermediary. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if the law, if a law, had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. This is complicated, right? Paul, using big concepts, he's speaking very, very complicated topics here. His point is, if we had been able to follow the law and so attain righteousness, then the law would have been good enough. But as it stands, the law was only good enough to show us that we were terrible. To show us how insanely broken we are. To point out our sin and our need of rescue. Verse 22. This is is really interesting. If the Scripture, or but the Scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. The law imprisoned everyone. Brought all of humanity into the same place of bondage and we're all broken and proven broken by the fact that we can't escape. We're imprisoned. It's really interesting when you think about it, the fact that the law imprisons us and tie that to the reality that we we run back to the law. We run back to the regulation. We run back to setting standards of goodness that prove that we are better than each other. We're all in the same jail. But I decorate the bars on my side of the jail. Because I'm better than you. We're all imprisoned. And we're all in the same place so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. We're all at the same starting point. And the offering of grace through Jesus Christ comes to all of us in the same place. Brokenness. Imprisonment. Verse 23 says, Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came. In order that we might be justified by faith. It's interesting, the word guardian here is translated differently in different places. Uh, Tutor, babysitter, I think, in some of the more modern (laughs) paraphrases. The law is our guardian, our babysitter, one who is put in charge when the rightful parent isn't there. Any of you guys remember when you were kids and you had a babysitter? Yeah. Um, now you can't get this messed up here, right? Like, I had a babysitter once. I only remember once. It was a household of rambunctious boys, and I think that's all that we could handle. Like, we, that was it. Our babysitter just happened to be uh, a neighbor boy who was older than us, and and. We thought he was pretty cool. My mom's sitting in the audience right now, so this, I don't know if you've heard this before, but. (laughs) This may actually be the reason he never came back. I don't know. Um, But we we just had a blast. We had a great time. He got out our BB guns and he let us shoot our BB guns. And like, that wasn't abnormal. We had guns. We lived in the woods. But he 
He found a way to shoot needles through our BB gun. She didn't know. Okay. Uh, so that wasn't the reason. I don't know what the other reason was. Um, but we had these like rubber uh, playground balls and stuff, and he set them up for targets, and we shoot needles into them. Uh, it was just a great time, right? That's not the picture of this guardian, right? If you have a, a memory of having a babysitter and everything just being fantastic and amazing, that's not the picture here. The picture here is one who is placed in charge of making sure you toe the line all the time of refining you in every way and disciplining you if you step down a line. This is like old school. <laughs> the original hearers of this would have read this and gone like, ugh, I hated those days. I never want to be in care of the guardian again. until Christ came. In order that we might be justified by faith. But now that, now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, we are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And you are Christ's. If you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring. Heirs according to promise. The covenant, the unilateral covenant that God made with Abraham, God made in full view of you and me. Co heirs, heirs of promise, sons of God. No longer Jew or Greek, slave or free. No longer male nor female, female, we are all equal in the body. Spiritual access to God. What a cool picture, really, when you think about it. I, you don't come across it very often anymore because babysitters are super afraid to discipline kids. But what a cool picture when, when the parents show back up and the kids are excited to run to their parents. They'd rather be present with their parents than have their parents be the disciplinarians and the ones that are always lording it over them and putting their thumb down on them and preferring time with the babysitter where they get to just do whatever. The law was our guardian, our babysitter. The rules and the regulations that we place over ourselves, they are self-imposed efforts at self-righteousness. And they're broken. Because they can never produce righteousness. But Jesus came. And we are heirs according to promise. Chapter 4 says this. Paul explains, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. 
That's a common phrase, huh? The elementary principles of the world. Paul's talking about everything that's basic. We were enslaved by them. Impulses. Impulses as like base level as the desire to eat. The desire to procreate. The desire to be better than the people next to us. To be a bully. To prove our worth. To have popularity. We were enslaved by them. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. And I, I just have this beautiful picture of the reality. The law put us all in prison. All under the law. All in jail. Not just the Jews. It did that, but all of humanity. And into that jail cell, God sent forth His Son born of woman. Born under the law. To redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Now what a beautiful picture. It's, it's interesting if you take a step back and, and just think through, like why did Jesus have to be born as a baby? Like how weird is that? God in the flesh. Right here. Born of a woman, born under the law. To redeem those under the law. To stage a jailbreak. So that we might all receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. This is crazy. Just unbelievable, like, magnitude of God's heart for us. Not that we just make it into heaven. Not that we just, you know, have a place on a hill where we can see it. God telling us we are co-heirs with Christ. Sons. And TJ talked about this last week. The imagery here is sons because culturally, inheritance only went to the sons. So ladies, spiritually, your sons. Heirs. It's one of the reasons why Paul can say there's no longer men and women. Just heirs. You are no longer a slave. You're not a slave to anything. You don't have to be a slave to sin, the elementary principles of this world, and you don't have to run back to the law to be enslaved again by it because it can't produce righteousness in you. It can only produce self-righteousness, which by distinction is the opposite of what God is looking for. Looking for sons, heirs, heirs of promise, promise he gave to Abraham. 
Which is why it is absolutely fitting that we sing Father Abraham. I want to I want to end and just before you get excited we're we got a long time to go. But I want to bring you back. Back to the beginning of chapter 3 and a couple verses I want to look at because the whole point the whole point is the promise right standing before the Lord. And Father God, as we look at this once again, let's ask, Father, that You would give us eyes to see. Give us spiritual ability to discern Your heart for us and spiritual eyes to see where we stand before You. Chapter 3, verse 2. Paul says, let me ask you only this. Like, this is the big question. The biggest question. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Now, there's a huge question there, right? Works of the law or by hearing with faith? And the distinction means everything. But the first part of the question is, did you receive the Spirit? Stop. Did you receive the Spirit? I just want to invite you Now close your eyes, bow your head. There's no other way, right? Like I got... You have to get this. Did you receive the Spirit? If the answer is no, then the rest of the question doesn't matter. So listen to God speak to you now. Did you receive the Spirit? The rest of the question makes just so the simple point that you can only receive the Spirit by hearing with faith. Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being perfected in the flesh? Which simply means having Receive the Spirit by faith and faith alone in Christ alone. Are you now trying to perfect yourself by accomplishing things? Or are you continuing in the Spirit by faith? Knowing that by faith God is refining you. Drawing you to Himself changing your heart, renewing your mind. (laughs) 
In Christ Jesus, verse 14 says, In Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. The entirety of the point is that we receive the Spirit. We're going to close with worship. And close is probably the wrong word. I just encourage you. We're going to worship. And I would encourage you, listen. Listen to the Spirit. Listen to God's movement in your life, in your heart. If you have never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, by faith alone, then you have never experienced freedom. You're still in the cage. Father, help. He would speak, speak to each one. For those of in the room that have received the Spirit, the promise, Holy Spirit, by faith, and reveal to them the ways in which maybe they're trying to refine themselves, justify sanctify themselves by works rather than just being your son. And for anyone in here that has not experienced grace, freedom, forgiveness, escape from the prison, how would you show them the way? Speak to us, Father.